Good day, radio listeners. Welcome to this edition of the Pure Sex Radio broadcast. My name is Jonathan, and I'm glad that you've decided to join us. Uh, This week's uh, episode is taken from our Grace Based Recovery webinar series that we've been doing. Uh, The Grace Based Recovery book has nine key principles in it for how to go through the recovery process from a grace based paradigm, a grace based perspective. And so we've been, over the last many months, we've been going through each of the various nine principles that are in there. And so this week we're going to be unpacking the seventh principle, which is grace to forgive and kind of understanding what are the the two sides of forgiveness in recovery and what is the amend making process look like. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the Grace Based Recovery book or the webinar series, just go to gracebasedrecovery.com and you can get information about the uh, next upcoming uh, webinar as well as all of the previous webinars. You can get access to all of those and, of course, information about the book and how you can get a hold of that. It's gracebasedrecovery.com. This week's session is all about the seventh principle, grace to forgive. I hope it really helps you understand a little more fully what the process of making amends and recovery looks like from a grace-based perspective. Enjoy. Now, the main idea from this chapter is that there's two sides uh, to forgiveness. We, uh, there's the two sides of forgiveness, this idea that we need to receive forgiveness and we need to offer forgiveness. So true recovery exists inside the realm of forgiveness. It is a, it's a misnomer to think that we can be sober, that we can be free, that we can actually be living um, uh, free from our addictions and strongholds while still holding on to unforgiveness. And so we need to unpack this to see what it looks like. The key scripture passage that we use for this particular chapter and this idea of grace to forgive is found in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. And the Apostle Paul states it this way. He says, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. I wish I could say that, you know, this whole this whole notion of forgiveness in recovery is is optional. But the reality is, is this is explicitly a command. We're told to forgive. Now we're gonna unpack this a little bit because, you know, a lot of times we see a command and we realize, man, these commands. They, they, they don't seem to match up with where I'm at. How do I get to this point where I'm able to forgive? How do I get to this point where I'm able to receive forgiveness or, or then offer forgiveness? And so that's, that's what we're going to spend a little bit of time unpacking here. And that's kind of what this chapter is about is um, how do we do this? How do we press into this? So some key thoughts uh, from this particular uh, chapter. First, forgiveness is a process can't flip a switch to forgive. I wish you could, but you can't. There's not, there's not a switch that you can just say, okay, I'm just going to flip this switch and everything's going to line up and I'm going to be ready to forgive. In the chapter, um, I re- we revisit the story of Joe. Joe is a guy that we've kind of been following throughout the book and kind of unpacking his story and what does it look like for him to engage in recovery in this group uh, that's grace-based. And in this particular chapter, we, we unpack a little bit of Joe's history and the fact that he experienced abuse, uh, sexual abuse, as a, as a child. And he is really struggling with this idea of forgiveness because he's saying, listen, I, I know what the Bible says. I know that, you know, I'm supposed to forgive, but I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to get there. And in the middle of page 47... The paragraph says, forgiveness is a process, a painful and difficult one. There's agony in forgiveness because it requires forgivers to choose not to punish the one who offended them. Joe's neighbor deserved to be punished for what he did severely. That's why Joe's process of forgiveness wasn't easy. 
He had to, to decide if he wanted to release his neighbor from the penalty he deserved, and that is no easy decision. See, that's really kind of what forgiveness boils down to, especially when we need to forgive someone else, is it's a decision of whether or not we truly want to release that person from the penalty that he deserves. That's tough. In other words, we've got to choose to say, I'm not going to be the one to push for punishment. Now, what's hard about that is that it doesn't mean that there's not justice, that there's not a deserving penalty there. Um, we are told that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And because of that, the wages of sin is death. We all deserve death. And yet the forgiveness of God says that he chose to, in our place, to, he chose to withhold that judgment through taking the penalty on himself, taking the penalty on his very own son, Jesus Christ. That's what forgiveness looks like. It's a, it's a bearing, in some ways, it's a bearing of the penalty ourselves because we're saying, I'm not going to hold that against that other person. And let's just admit, that's a process. It's going to take time. Uh, also, forgiveness is more than a feeling. It's a choice. You have to choose to forgive. And let me share with you a paragraph from page 49 in, in the book. It's in the middle of that page. It says here, keep in mind, though, that forgiveness is a choice. Your feelings may not coincide with what you know you must do. This does not mean that feelings don't matter when it comes to forgiveness only that they are not the determining factor in choosing to forgive those who have wronged you. So here's the thing. There is a point in time when we're dealing with this issue of forgiveness, when we're thinking about the, the wounds that have been inflicted upon us. Every single one of us at some point in our lives growing up had somebody else's brokenness dumped into our lives that had a shaping influence on us mentally and emotionally and even physically sometimes. And so, and that affects our emotions, right? It affects our feelings. So when later on we're, we're being pressed with this even command by God that says, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. It doesn't match up a lot of times with our feelings. Our feelings are saying, I want justice. I want punishment for what that person did to me. And while there's a righteousness to that anger, there's a point at which that begins to put us into prison. The unforgiveness puts us into chains. It puts us into further bondage. And so to be released from that, there is a point at which we have to say, my feelings are real, my feelings are valid, but I'm going to make a choice to forgive. And I'm not saying that that will just automatically change your feelings. But so many times it's when we recognize that our will has the ability to override our emotions. We can make right choices that lead to right actions. And so many times out of those right actions, that's where we find the freedom because we realize our will can actually transcend even our feelings. And so there does come a point at which we've got to set our face like a flint <laughs> towards forgiveness and say, I have to do this even if my even if my heart, even my, if my emotions are not there yet. I'm not saying to rush that. Remember, it's a process. But I am saying there's going to come a tipping point where the decision has to be made, even if and even when your feelings don't line up with that, um, that choice. Finally here, we have to recognize too that for forgiveness is two-sided. And what I mean by that is there are certainly wounds that have been inflicted upon us and we must then forgive those who have hurt us, those who have wounded us. But there's also the other side that we have to recognize that our selfishness and our own behavior has wounded others. We've, we've wounded those who we've been selfish against and who we have hurt because of our own brokenness. And so to seek to make amends with those you've wounded requires humble confession and genuine remorse. The, the Bible talks in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 about a godly sorrow that produces repentance. And there needs to be a point at which we recognize, oh my goodness, the, the ways in which I have been selfish and self-centered have had a direct and negative impact on those who are closest to me. I've hurt other people. 
And so therefore, we need to have a sorrow that isn't a sorrow, a worldly sorrow that says, I'm sorry I got caught, or I'm, I'm sorry that this happened because now the circumstance is ugly and difficult and there's conflict, but a godly sorrow that says, oh, I've sinned against a holy God. David in Psalm 51 says, against you and you only, God, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Now, he was referencing there the sin that he'd committed with Bathsheba. And it, it might seem unusual that he says, against you and you only, God, have I sinned, when the reality is, well, no, he sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against Bathsheba's husband by having him murdered. He sinned against the nation by not being where he needed to be, where kings needed to be, and he wasn't where he needed to be. So he sinned against a lot of other people. There were effects of his sin on other people, but ultimately he recognized that all of that was ultimately a sin against a holy God, and there's a brokenness there. There's a sorrow, and when we have that true repentance, that godly sorrow, then we we can go and seek to make amends with the others that we've hurt with an attitude of humility and contrition rather than just an attitude of, let's try to patch this up, move, move past it and, you know, get, put the past in the past kind of a mentality. So those are some key thoughts to this idea of, of grace to forgive. Now we want to ask some key questions. Uh, what are some key questions that come out of this idea of grace to forgive? First is, how does it make you feel that forgiveness is essential to the recovery process? So we don't, we don't want to dismiss feelings, um, but we also don't want to allow them to dictate our decision to forgive or not to forgive, but, but really realize that it's going to take time to grieve through the losses of other people's brokenness getting dumped into your life. There's going to be real difficult emotions surrounding that. And so you're going to have to work through the feeling of shame and disappointment and anger, fear. And when you grieve, grieving is a process of releasing what is holding you back from forgiveness. So you need to feel it, feel the emotion, and then, and then choose to forgive. Um, I really recommend, I highly recommend this chapter especially, I highly recommend uh, getting plugged in with a professional counselor for a lot of this work. Uh, because when you're talking about maybe wounds from your past that inv involved abuse of a physical or sexual nature, um, even of an emotional nature, if you were constantly belittled and berated by your parents, um, but, but any kind of abuse and wounds that we've had from our history, I really think this working through to a point of forgiveness and working through to embracing an attitude of forgiveness is something that can benefit from the help of a really well-trained professional counselor. And so to help you find a counselor that might be uh, beneficial to you in this area, I'd recommend that you go to our website, bebroken.com and under get help, uh, there's a link there that says uh, find a counselor is you're going to have feelings come up that maybe you haven't dealt with for years. Maybe you've stuffed and, and it could erupt in a massive way, but you're going to need to work through that in order to get to that decision point of forgiving. If you just kind of flippantly forgive and stuff the emotion and don't really work through what the emotions are trying to tell you about where your wounds are, um, then I think it's only a matter of time before there's an explosion later on. Another question we've got to ask ourselves is, how has God forgiven you? Write it down. Keep in mind, remember this passage in Colossians. It says, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. So we have to ask ourselves, okay, how has the Lord forgiven me? Um, one thing we have to recognize is that he's forgiven us completely. That's huge. God has not forgiven you partially in Christ. It's not like he says, I've forgiven 70% of your sins, but you're really going to have to work your butt off for the last 30% of the sins that you commit. No, no. He's forgiven you completely, 100%. Nothing you have done, will do today, or could do tomorrow could negate the forgiveness that you have in Jesus. 
So as the Lord has forgiven us, he's forgiven us completely. So you must forgive. Well, I got to work towards then figuring out how do I forgive completely? The other thing is, uh, along with that idea of the Lord forgiving us completely, is that he forgives us in an ongoing way. Uh, And so a lot of times you can have some watershed moments when it comes to forgiving people in your past and recognizing, okay, I'm, I'm driving a stake in the ground. I'm I'm making a marker here that says, I forgive that person. Whether you, can, whether you do it directly or indirectly, you forgive. Forgiveness is more about what you're doing in your heart than necessarily what you're doing with your mouth. You forgive, but guess what's going to happen tomorrow or maybe next week or next month? Something's going to trigger a desire for unforgiveness to come back into your heart. Something's going to trigger that old wound and unforgiveness will want to rise to the surface. So you're going to have to also have an ongoing aspect of forgiveness. I remember when my wife and I, uh, after we had been separated for nine months because of my sexual addiction and my, um, all of my issues, when we got back together, I mean, she forgave me. But one of the things that she has, has said many times, um, as she's taught other ladies and as she shared her story, is that, She realized that, well, forgiveness is a decision, and you can make a point in time in which you say, I forgive, and I forgive completely. She says it's still a daily decision to remain in that forgiveness and to remind yourself of that forgiveness. Because she said, hey, there are plenty of opportunities later on where something would trigger her old fears or her old wounds or the old, you know, the old me. And where it would be really easy for her to pull up and dredge up all those things from the past that then she could throw in my face. But forgiveness says, no, I'm going to keep choosing to forgive. And so that's why I think it's important to write down specifically, how has God forgiven you? What are the sins that he's forgiven you of? What are the attitudes and the motives of your heart that have been impure and selfish that he has forgiven you of? Write those things down, as, and as you see that list growing and growing and growing, I don't know about you, but when I've done that exercise and I've written down the ways in which I've seen a merciful and loving God forgive a wretch like me, my heart grows softer and softer and softer, even against those who have done wretched things against me, because I recognize that against God and God only, have I sinned and done what is evil in his sight? And when I see that he is forgiven and that he has cast my sin as far as the east is from the west, it melts me. It makes me realize I don't have a right to take a club and take a hammer against those who have offended me because the very God, holy God of the universe has extended mercy and forgiveness to me. And so it's, it's a good exercise to be fully and increasingly aware of just how much God has forgiven us um, because then it, it grows mercy in our own hearts towards those who have offended us. Another good question is, is anything blocking you from receiving or offering forgiveness? Spend some time really assessing what might be holding you back from receiving or offering forgiveness. Is it shame? Is it fear? Is it anger or doubt or pride? These are just a few of the things that can be obstacles to forgiveness. If it's sin, repent. If it's a wound, seek God's healing. So deal with the obstacles so you can be freed up to engage forgiveness and experience greater freedom in your recovery. And I would say this is an ongoing exercise in terms of, uh, you know, because every day presents a new opportunity to be wounded or to wound somebody else, right? Even if it's not to the same degree, maybe that a sexual addiction um, can wound somebody else. There's plenty of ways that we can offend and hurt people and plenty of ways that people can offend and hurt us. And so we need to constantly be in this mode of what's blocking me? from receiving forgiveness? Is it pride? Do I really think that I deserve God's love and mercy? Do I really think I, you know, is that blocking me from really fully receiving forgiveness? Or, or maybe it's um, fear to offer forgiveness to somebody else because couldn't they just hurt me all over again? Uh, we see this in a lot of wives. 
who are struggling to say, I don't, I, I feel like I need to hold on to some unforgiveness, kind of as like a trump card, you know, kind of as an ace up my sleeve of just, I need to have some ammunition because if I fully forgive, what's the guarantee that he can't hurt me all over again? And that's part of it here is that forgiveness is a risk. Receiving forgiveness is even a risk because I have to drop my guard. I have to allow forgiveness to enter my life. I have to give up control. I have to humble myself in order to receive forgiveness. There's a risk there of really being known. There's a risk in giving, offering forgiveness because, hey, there's no guarantee that that person can't hurt you again. And think about it from God's perspective, right? He offers us forgiveness. And has any, can any one of us claim that even today, only halfway through in the day, that we haven't in some way offended a holy God. I have to confess, I haven't had perfectly righteous thoughts. I haven't obeyed every single command that he's told me to do. And so even in half of a day, I have to admit that I have offended a holy God, and yet he still, through Christ, extends forgiveness to me. So finally, we've got a group exercise here that is really practical. Um, first, it talks about living out the golden rule, which we find in Scripture, Luke 6.31, the idea of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And this is a way to actually kind of preempt the need to ask for forgiveness. Think about it this way. If, if, if we are all treating others as we would like for them to treat us, how often do you think we will offend another person? I would say it's a very, very small percentage or likelihood that we would offend somebody else, like need to seek their forgiveness because we've, we've wounded them or, or offended them. And so, so the golden rule is a great way to kind of get out ahead of this constant need to be seeking forgiveness from other people. Think of it this way. It's, it's a way to practice empathy. When I'm engaging another person, what would happen if I consciously bring to my mind, how is what I'm saying, how is what I'm doing impacting them? If I were in their shoes, how would this sound to them? If I were in their shoes, what would my demeanor communicate to them? And when we practice empathy, it goes a long way for building humility, um, loving people well, and just really kind of... Uh, just treating people the way God designed us to treat each other. But then we also need to address the actual practice of forgiveness. So the golden rule is a great way like, hey, drive a stake in the ground from today forward and saying, I want to get better at living by the golden rule so that I don't find myself in this constant, you know, uh, merry-go-round or hamster wheel of having to seem like I'm always offending people in the same way. I'm always hurting my wife or my husband in the same way and having to ask forgiveness for the same things. When we practice the golden rule, we're practicing empathy. We're putting ourselves in that other person's shoes. And so it helps us, I guess I could say, behave better, speak better, um, have better motives towards what we're doing to that other person. But then the reality is, guess what? Well, there's still going to be the need to forgive, to forgive and to seek forgiveness. And so the two questions you ask yourself is, okay, who do I need to forgive? Who are the people that I'm, I'm holding unforgiveness against? Who are the people that have offended me? Um, and I need to actually decide to forgive them. And then the second question is, who do I need to make amends with? Who, who do I know that I have offended? Um, who are the people that I need to actually reach out to and seek to make amends with? And so I'd say that's kind of really where, um, uh, you know, where, where you need to land. There's a whole lot more to forgiveness, right? In terms, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen here so we can get, uh, get back down here to the, the questions. Um, you know, there's, there's even some more nuts and bolts of how to forgive, right? Uh, we need to think through in terms of, okay, who specifically do I need to forgive? What do I need to forgive them of? I think we need to be specific there. Like, what's the specific thing? Was it something they said? Was it something they did? Um, was it maybe, uh, we could say, a, an offense of omission? Like, hey, they had said they were going to do something and then they didn't do it. And that creates a wound as well. And so being specific there. And then the other thing too is, is am I going to 
am I going to make direct amends here or do I need to make indirect amends? Uh, an indirect means it would, I, I can't go to the person directly. Like either they're dead or um, it just wouldn't be wise or healthy to try to actually interact with that person. Maybe it's somebody who abused you from your past. It just wouldn't be a good idea to have contact. The, the good news is that you can still go through the process of forgiveness, even if you are not going to have contact with the person who either offended you or the person that you offended, because again, it's either not possible or it would be unwise. And I, the way I did this, like for instance, my dad uh, was somebody that I needed to forgive when I got into recovery. Well, I got into recovery seven years after my dad had died. So there was no way that I could actually go to him directly. But I did some great letter writing exercises where I wrote out some of the specific things in which I felt like these are wounds in my life that my dad uh, either inflicted intentionally or by omission. And just writing that out and really releasing him through forgiveness was powerful. I also did some role-playing exercises with a counselor that helped me kind of work through some of those issues as well, where the counselor played the role of my dad. I was me. Sometimes we'd even flip it where I actually played the role of my dad. The counselor played me to really just be able to kind of, again, that empathy, right? Get into the mindset of even the brokenness of my father and, and, and where was some of that coming from? Um, so there's ways to still go about working through forgiveness, even if you don't have uh, the person that you can go to directly. All right, so just a reminder, you can use the Q&A feature to send in your questions. I've got some questions here that I want to try to begin addressing. Um, okay, one of this I think I, I just addressed in terms of what if the person or persons I need to forgive are not alive and I have no way to get in touch, you know, can I still offer forgiveness? Yes, you can. And I think I just described that in terms of being able to go through some maybe letter writing exercises, role playing with a counselor. Um, also, I think just, just being able to uh, go through that process in prayer with God. Um, God is, we're told that he is our wonderful counselor. You know, and he gives us the helper, his Holy Spirit within us, that even when we don't know the exact right words to pray, we're told that the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf to the Father with groanings that are too deep to utter. So the issue is, can you bring all of that brokenness and unforgiveness, can you bring all of that pain and all that, all those wounds to God, even if you don't have words to wrap around it, and just put yourself in a posture of, God, I don't know how to communicate this. I don't know how to really release this. I don't know how to get to a point where I really have, am choosing forgiveness, so I'm trusting your Holy Spirit to intercede on my behalf, to, to, to communicate what I'm trying to communicate that I don't know how, and then trusting you to give me what I need in order to make the choice to forgive, and then to keep making the choice to forgive. Another question here is, uh, what if someone in my group pushes back on this idea of forgiveness being essential in recovery? Uh, they might say, isn't sobriety or just not acting out a sufficient goal for an addict? Why press into the whole forgiveness stuff? And now I, you know, at first it's, it may be easy to kind of dismiss this question. And go, Of course, forgiveness is important, but I get it. I get, I get the, the desire to just say, can we keep the forgiveness stuff outside of the recovery process? Because let's just be honest, it's messy, it's painful, it's going to bring up old wounds, it's going to bring up old shame. Um, and so many times I think we have this mentality, especially as men, we have this mentality when we think about recovery is the past is the past, leave it in the past. Um funny though how it doesn't the past doesn't stay in the past right it's actually it's actually very much your past that is part of what the problem is in recovery right now and so absolutely you're going to need to work through this you're going to need to actually um, deal with the forgiveness issue and the unforgiveness that you're still holding on in your life and so just be sure that this is a uh, this is something you're going to have to face so what i would say to that group member is i appreciate the feeling of maybe not wanting to get into that, maybe just wanting to kind of leave that to the side, um, but it's not going to stay there. And the reality is you're going to have to face it at some point anyway. 
And, and also just remembering, you cannot say that I can be holding unforgiveness while simultaneously living a truly sober, free life. It doesn't work that way. Unforgiveness creates a prison of its own. And not only that, but I think also, you know, there's the unforgiveness that we hold against those who've offended us. But keep in mind, there can also be um, the, the, the unforgiveness that is still held against us. Now, we can't, we can't make choices for other people. But what I'm saying is a lot of times guys won't go into, or people in recovery, won't go into the amend-making process because they know those are messy conversations. To actually seek somebody's forgiveness, to actually confess our sins to them, to actually humble ourselves and admit to somebody, I was absolutely wrong in how I treated you. Now, you can't go beyond that. You can't then try to force them to forgive you. But we do need to make amends. We do need to seek to make amends and, and make things right to the extent that we can. Another question here is, I have someone in my group who faced horrible sexual abuse as a child. I feel way out of my league trying to help them work through their issues of forgiveness. What do I do and how can I help them? I really appreciate this question. I, I don't want anybody on this call or watching this webinar to think that somehow, because there's a chapter in the book on, on forgiveness, that somehow, you, if you're a group leader, that you've got to be an expert now, or you've got to be a counselor to be able to work through every possible scenario of wound and abuse, and, and that you're, now it's on your shoulders to walk a person through personally this whole process of forgiveness. A lot of times what you'll have in a group setting is, is it exposes and it kind of opens up this can of worms of unforgiveness. I, all I'm saying as a group leader is, is be gracious, be empathetic, um, try to connect with their story as best you can, and then gently lead them towards professional counseling. Not in a way that says, go over there and get counseling help and then come back. No, 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 you're still walking with them. They're still part of the group. They still belong in the group. Make sure they understand that but also be willing to acknowledge your own limitations and saying, I, man, I, I don't really know how to get you from here to there in terms of specifically dealing with this abuse that you faced, but I know of some people that can, and that's where you can connect them to us in terms of our counseling network and some of the specific professionals that we have that work in this area of dealing with uh, walking through forgiveness from deep wounds of the past. Um, well, at the same time, you're saying, I'm your friend. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to pray with you. Um, but don't feel like you now have the burden on your shoulders to be the expert or be the professional. But great question, and I appreciate your heart to want to help people who have been struggling with those kinds of past abuses. Okay, so let me, uh, there's another question here. Uh, what does it actually look like to empathize with someone I've hurt? I mean, they're piping mad. Yeah, a lot of times this happens in a marriage relationship, right? A wife is super mad when, um, when she learns of her husband's acting out. Uh, so, won't it come across as trite or even condescending if I try to identify with their pain? Help me understand empathy better as it relates to making amends. This is a great question. And I had to kind of navigate this with my own, in my own marriage and with my wife when we got back together is, yeah, what does it look like for me to empathize with her? Because we're different. We are different. Um, she hasn't offended me in exactly the same way that I offended her in terms of sexual betrayal. So when she is feeling wounded, she, when she is hurt, when her fears rise up, what does it look like for me to try to empathize? Let me tell you, let me give you two two ways of thinking about how to do this. There's some empathy that we could do separate from that person. And then there's some empathy that we can try to do with that person. So the empathy that we try to do separate. So when my wife and I, we were, uh, we were separated, my counselor actually could realize, could tell that I couldn't fully grasp the degree and the depth of pain that I had caused my wife. So he gave me this empathy exercise. And this is something that I was able to do on my own, you know, separate from my wife. And he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about, you know, these years in which you have been building this secret and betraying your wife through sexual sin and just being a general jerk to live with. 
And he says, and what I want you to do is I want you to think through that and as best you can try to see it from your wife's perspective. What was she thinking and feeling when you were doing all these things? And that brought me to a new level, that kind of trying to empathize, trying to put myself in her shoes and think through what did this do to her? That broke me in a whole new way. It shattered me. It gave me a whole new level of, of humility and um, sorrow over what I had done. It, it helped me empathize in that way of be, being able to say, oh my goodness, I had never really looked at my sinfulness and my selfishness and pride through her eyes and trying to do that through her eyes. Recognize we can't do this perfectly. I mean, we're not that other person. But to be able to try, to try is huge because then it shows you, it exposes your selfishness, it exposes your sin. And it, it, it's a good breaking. It's a breaking of our pride. So that then when I was able to finally have interactions with her after our separation, I had a whole new level of humility and respect and care and love for her um, that was not based on trying to get anything from her. It was like, I was wrong. Absolutely. Period. I was wrong. Period. Not trying to do anything after that to try to convince her that somehow I'm a great guy. No, I was wrong. Flat out. Now, in terms of trying to empathize as you are in relationship, I think what that looks like is drawing that person out. See, sometimes when somebody comes and says, what are you doing? Or, you know, they may make a false accusation or they may, their fear and their anger just spews out on top of you. Our natural inclination is defense, right? We want to we put up our walls of defense. I think empathy says, before I try to defend myself, whether I'm right or wrong, let me try to understand them. Let me try to understand where they're coming from. And so being able to calm yourself down and ask questions that are trying to draw them out. One of the best things we can say to a person is, tell me more about that. Tell me more. Help me understand more of what's going on right now. And so it's not coming across like, Try or condescending. You're not trying to say, I know exactly what you feel and now I'm going to respond in kind. No, it's actually saying, I don't understand how you feel, but I want to. And so being as gentle, calm, um, you know, kind as you possibly can is going to go a long way for being able to help them to get it all out and for you to be able to then try to serve and care for them in a way that, um, really upholds forgiveness, upholds the golden rule, upholds uh, the goodness of, of uh, just being humble and, and having good character. Uh, all of this is messy, okay? So when we talk about grace to forgive, that's why we need grace, because it's absolutely a messy thing. And we're not perfect, which is why we lean completely on the perfection and the goodness of Jesus Christ. Well, listeners, I hope that that was both encouraging and insightful and maybe even challenging. I know that the issue of forgiveness is difficult, um, but it's so necessary in the process of healing and growth and recovery. Again, if you'd like more information about the book or the webinar series, just go to gracebasedrecovery.com. Of course, if you want information about the radio program or how you can come alongside as a partner or just uh, get access to all the hundreds of archived podcasts that we have, you can go to puresexradio.com or you can hit us up on Twitter at puresexradio. Thanks for being with us this week, and we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on the Pure Sex Radio broadcast. Take care. Mm-hmm.